Welcome, everyone. First, to start off, a show of hands. Who's heard of keto diets? <laughs> oh, okay, that's pretty much everyone. Who knows someone who's tried a keto diet? Okay, yeah, pretty much everyone. All right, so people try these for weight loss. They try them to try and lower their blood sugar. But do they work? Are they even safe? Today, we're going to look at the evidence and find out. So again, for this talk, we are going to first figure out what exactly a keto diet is. The term is used kind of loosely. Next, we'll look at the evidence for and against keto diets for different conditions. We'll look at some of the risks associated with these kinds of diets. And then we'll also talk about some of those greatest hits questions that you may have already gotten from patients, or if not, you will probably get at some point. All right, so first, what exactly is a keto or ketogenic diet? So a keto diet is simply a diet that has the carb intake drastically reduced, fat intake greatly increased, and what does that do in the body? It induces ketosis or the production of ketone bodies. So this is the body's emergency backup system when not enough glucose is available. So to understand how ketogenic diets work in the body, it first pays to look, go back to anatomy and physiology and look at basic nutrient metabolism. So uh, the liver is sort of a center for metabolic functions in the body, so that's why it's here first in the diagram. And there are three, made three macronutrients. We have carbohydrates, protein, and fats. This should all look sort of vaguely familiar by this point. So carbohydrates and protein pass by the liver first um, in digestion and absorption, and then fats actually go to the rest of the body first before passing to the liver. So carbohydrates enter the bloodstream predominantly as glucose. They're there used as metabolic fuel for brains and other, the brain and other tissues. Note that the brain is an obligate glucose consumer, so it has to have glucose or a substitute. It cannot run directly on fats. And any excess glucose that we take in or carbohydrate is stored as fat in fat cells. Now protein comes into the bloodstream as amino acids. Those are used for tissue repairs. Excess amino acid will not give you giant muscles. It will have the nitrogenous waste removed and the excess part will then be stored as fat. And then fats enter the body and can be, of course, excess can be stored. They can also fuel the muscle and liver cells directly. So now what happens in ketosis? So the most potent inducer of ketosis, as you all may know, is fasting. So what happens in fasting? Macronutrient intake, kaput, none of those. So first thing that happens is that the body burns the liver's glycogen stores. Those last about 12 to 18 hours. The next thing that happens, the body says, you know, all right, four to six hours in, it says, we really could use some more glucose, not sure how long this whole fast thing is going to go on. So gluconeogenesis, or the new creation of glucose, begins. What does the body make it out of? It makes it out of amino acids coming from the muscle tissue. So those amino acids are used to make new glucose. So again, you can see here the body really would prefer to use glucose. Thank you very much. And it'll jump through all kinds of hoops to do so. Now, about two to three days into a fast, you've always got some free fatty acids that are being used to fuel those tissues that can burn them. But in terms of keeping the brain running and other tissues that require glucose normally, the body starts to divert fats into ketosis or the generation of ketone bodies. Those can then be used in place of glucose to fuel things like the brain. Now, how do we trick the body into making ketone bodies while it's still being fed? This is where it gets interesting. So the first thing you do is you drastically, like we said, you drastically reduce carbohydrate intake. Protein is interesting, so there will still be some modest protein intake. What happens with that? Again, people think, oh, I'm going to get you know, big muscles on a keto diet, bring in lots of protein. That's not at all what happens. So the bare minimum of amino acids are diverted to tissue repair, but as many as possible are used to make more glucose. So actually, the more protein in a diet, the less ketogenic it is because of this pathway. And then finally, the fats will be coming in from the diet in quantity. Any excess, of course, will be stored as fats. Some can be burned by the muscles directly, but the majority of it is going to be diverted into ketosis. So what are these ketone bodies? Well, there are two major ones. There's beta-hydroxybutyric acid. There's acetoacetic acid. Note, both are acids, so they will have to be buffered to keep the blood pH in the normal range. And then there's a byproduct, which is acetone, which is also the major ingredient in nail polish remover. Mm -hmm. Fun fact. All right, so let's first talk about the different kinds of keto diets, because again, I'm sure you've heard the word just thrown around. So the original kind of ketogenic diet was Famine, yes, so again, the most, the most potent inducer of ketosis. We've gotten a little more sophisticated since then. 
and what we have now are different kinds of keto diets. So the original or classic ketogenic diet, this is a medically specific term. It refers to diets that were developed for seizure control, and they're used today to help reduce drug-resistant seizures. Gets a full 90% of calories from fat. The rest is divided up, that last 10%, divided up between protein and carbohydrates. So as you can see, if particularly dietitians out there, you may already know this, and the rest of you might as well, but RDA for protein is about 10% of calories from protein. And you can see here, this is actually a little bit below RDA. So a truly ketogenic diet that gives you maximal ketosis while feeding is actually a low protein diet. So the other piece to mention here is that these diets are so restrictive and dangerous, they are only to be initiated under hospitalization. So this is actually not something we want people striving for. Um, the Atkins initiation diet is actually not a whole lot different in terms of the calories it gets from carbohydrates. It's also used for seizure control. It's called the modified Atkins diet in that case. Um, it gets about the same amount of calories from carbohydrate, but it gets a lot more from protein. So it's actually a little bit less ketogenic than a classic ketogenic diet. In the research literature, any diet that restricts carbohydrate to 50 grams or less, give or take, um, on a daily basis is classified as ketogenic. The calories from protein here can vary quite dramatically, as we've already seen here, and that in turn will change the percent of calories from fat. And then we have low carb, which is another term that actually technically means anything, any diet that has carbohydrate intake below the RDA. That's about 25, 26% of calories from carbohydrate, which is 130 grams of carbohydrate. So a ketogenic diet is actually the most extreme form of a low carb diet. So this is actually a meal that's served to kids when they're on a classic ketogenic diet. It came, this recipe came from a children's hospital page. And it says it's a chicken salad recipe, but as you'll see, it is, as it is supposed to be, actually a fat salad. So the first ingredient, about three tablespoons of heavy cream. Next, we have 1.2 ounces of cucumbers and tomatoes, so just a little, you know, not a whole lot going on there. Next, we have about two tablespoons of mayonnaise. And then finally, down at the bottom, there's the chicken, and that's 0.7 ounces. That's like maybe three little dice in terms of size. It's very tiny, so again, it's more of a, more of a fat salad. So in the real world, in the wild, what do keto diets look like? Well, they look a lot like this. This was from Foodista. It was tagged as keto. These are egg and sausage muffins. I'm going to put muffins in air quotes here because there's nothing muffiny except the shape. Um, <laughs> they have a whole pound for 12 muffins. You get a pound of processed meat. You get nine eggs. You get some you know, whole dairy products in there. So most of us would look at this and say, ooh, this doesn't look like it's going to be so great for your heart. But this is how ketogenic diets are being practiced. At least they put some milk. They put a little bit of collard greens in there to try and save the day. Um, next up, so this is lunch and dinner. It's not really looking a whole lot better. This is from a low carb alpha blog. And you can see that they're talking about things that people can use to get on this kind of diet. And we're looking at lots of red meat, fried meats, because again, oil and protein, that's where they're looking to get their calories. And then it looks like we've got one here with some non-starchy vegetables, which is great. Um, <clears throat> except that it looks like it might be on like a little piece of whole grain toast, but it's actually on a fried egg. Mm. Okay, so now let's look at the actual evidence by condition, now that we know what these diets are. So the first one where we really do have some solid evidence is drug-resistant epilepsy. So we can see here that a classic ketogenic diet gives about half of people about 50% or greater reduction in seizures. So in the short term for these folks, there really is an advantage to a ketogenic diet. Um, the modified Atkins diet is also, again, used for seizure control. It's not as effective precisely because the protein is so high that it creates more glucose in the body through gluconeogenesis. And the reason this works, they don't entirely know why on the mechanism, but for starters, they're starving the body of its preferred brain fuel, which is glucose, so the brain cells do become a little less active. I don't know if most of us actually want that to happen, but um, <clears throat> it also can have some effects on neurotransmitters. So what about weight management, right? Because this is the reason most people are doing this kind of diet. And, well, lo and behold, keto diets truly can cause some weight loss, but according to the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, their evidence analysis library, no more than any other diet that similarly restricts calories. So there's no, there's no keto magic here. Um, but this was from 2006, so do we have anything a little more current? 
And we do, we have a 2013 meta-analysis. They looked at 13 randomized controlled trials. Each of them lasted at least 12 months. And what they found was that they compared keto diets, again, this is about 50 grams or 10% of calories from carbs or less, to low-fat diets, again, 30% of calories from fat, so not really that low-fat, but we'll go with it for the sake of this. And what they found was that keto dieters did lose just a hair more weight, about two pounds over one year. But when they looked at studies that went for two years, there was no difference. So this is a, an individual trial that I wanted you guys to hear about. And I think you might have heard a little bit of this from Dr. Kevin Hall yesterday because this is his data. So they took 17 overweight and obese men and they, I don't want to say locked them in, they confined them to a metabolic ward and controlled their feeding for 60 days. Yeah, this was a real commitment. Um, and so they, they also measured at least two days a week. I think they had them in a metabolic chamber, so measuring their energy expenditure and that sort of thing. And what they did was for the first 30 days, they had them on a balanced diet. About half of calories were from carbohydrates, about 15% from protein and the rest from fat. And then at day zero, they switched them over to a ketogenic diet, so still 5%, or I'm sorry, 5% of calories from carbohydrates, still 15 from protein, and then the balance of about 80% from fat. And the first 15 days are not shown here because they were adjusting the calorie levels to get a slow, steady rate of weight loss. And then at day 15 on the baseline diet, or negative 15 here, oops, on this chart, right here, they clamped the calories. So at this point, calories were the same, whether they were on the balanced diet or the keto diet. And what you can see is that they were sort of losing weight at a slow, steady rate. And then right here at day zero, they switched over to a ketogenic diet. And you know, they did. Their weight dropped pretty quickly there in that first week. There was a precipitous drop. So maybe, maybe keto diets are actually, maybe we should give them a little bit more of a shot. But what about actual fat loss? Didn't hold up quite the same way. So this graph, what you see here is that on day 15 to zero, again, that's the baseline diet. Their weight is going down at sort of a nice, you know, it's got a nice little slope downwards. Then when they hit the ketogenic diet, you can see that the slope of the line gets much flatter and shallower. So what happens is that their fat loss actually slows rather dramatically when they get onto a ketogenic diet for that first couple of weeks. And then it starts to pick up again and get back to where it was before. Sort of the take home here is they lost half a kilogram of body fat in about two weeks on the baseline diet. It took them about twice that long or 30 days to lose the same half kilogram once they transitioned onto a keto diet. So fat loss actually slows when they put people in these very carefully controlled conditions and look at what's happening in their bodies. So what about heart disease? This is a concern, you would think. And some people say, you know what, keto diets might actually be good because they might, maybe they actually improve blood lipid profiles, so let's find out. That same weight loss uh, meta-analysis also looked at some of the blood lipids what did they find? Well, they found that actually keto diets did. They, they decreased triglycerides more on a keto diet than a low-fat diet. Again, low-fat diet. They also increased good cholesterol just a little bit, but it was statistically significant. And then this is the interesting piece here. They actually, the bad cholesterol or LDL cholesterol went up. And the, confusing, the most confusing piece here is you would expect it maybe to go up on a diet like this, but normally we see it go down in the context of weight loss. All these folks were losing weight, but yet their bad cholesterol was increasing. So that's the opposite of what we would expect to see. So this is a single trial. This was done in 2004 down at Duke University. It was actually funded by the Atkins Foundation, but it has some interesting information for us here. They looked at 120 overweight people with high cholesterol. And what they found was looking at a keto again versus the same 30% of calories or low fat diet. They found that on the keto diet, weight dropped more. Um, the HDL was, this was not a statistically significant difference, but it looked a little better on the keto diet. And triglycerides seemed to be a lot better on the keto diet, right? They dropped a lot more than they did on the low-fat diet. LDL was about the same. Again, this is the context of weight loss, so we would have expected LDL to drop, and in this case it stayed the same. I should also say the folks who were on the um, ketogenic diet here were also getting an enormous number of supplements along with it. Um, so it's hard to really entirely tease apart what the supplements did, and the folks on the low-fat diet did not get that. But the scariest part here is that 
if you look not at the average, but at what's happening to some of these individuals, you see that this is a particularly risky diet style for some people. And the question is, we don't know who those people are coming in. So a third of participants, give or take, had their bad cholesterol increased by more than 10% over the course of this trial. One participant, and this was in just four weeks, had their bad cholesterol, which by the way should be 100 or lower, so they already were in not a great place, had their bad cholesterol go from 182 to 219 in four weeks, and their doctor asked them to drop from the study, which they did. Uh, another one had their cholesterol, their bad cholesterol, go up almost 100 points over the course of the study. So again, for some people, this can be extremely risky. And a third person developed chest pain, was diagnosed with coronary heart disease, and you know, this is not the kind of outcome we're looking for when we want people to lose weight. This is a CrossFit trial. How many people here have heard of CrossFit? Anyone? Okay, yeah, it's a really, it's a great workout, it's endurance, it's aerobic, it's strength training, it's all that stuff together. Interestingly, you would think that for things like sprint activities or anaerobic activities, that you would actually need to have good muscle glycogen stores, right? Some stored sugar to burn when you need that burst of energy. But for whatever reason, keto diets are trending right now amongst keto, um, CrossFit crossfitters as they call themselves so these researchers decided to try and find out if a keto diet impaired or improved their athletic performance so it was a small study it just had 12 participants it ran for three months um, healthy young adults again these are average age here of 31 and they just wanted to see what it did to body composition things like their resting energy expenditure you know anaerobic and aerobic athletic performance and then of course the effects on their serum um, lipids and the comparison group here was simply no diet change. So they weren't looking at it, you know, some other kind of intervention, just nothing going on. And what they found was that there was a loss of body fat itself in the keto dieters. But again, this isn't keto magic. This is because they cut their calories by more than 500 per day, possibly because they weren't feeling so great, but we'll get to that later. Uh, there was no particular change between the groups in terms of their, you know, resting energy expenditure, their athletic performance. Um, although I do want to have as a side note here that the folks in the keto group actually did 27 workouts versus just 20 for the people in the control group. So I'm a little surprised they didn't have an improvement in athletic performance, although that was not a statistically significant difference in workout number. Um, their beta hydroxy butyrate levels, which are, again, that one of those ketone bodies we talked about, were higher. So we know the folks on the keto diet were actually following a keto diet. And their LDL cholesterol is an interesting piece here. So the control diet, they started in a fine place, they ended in a fine place. This wasn't particularly a you know, significant result. But the people who started the keto diet, they didn't start in a great place, but good heavens, they really didn't end in a good place. So 12 weeks, they had an average increase in LDL of 40 points. So even though these are young, healthy people, by the time they got done with this 12-week you know, keto diet, they basically needed a statin. This is not where we want people to go. So these are heart scans from a 53-year-old businessman named Jody Gorin. He um, actually had these done for reasons unrelated to heart health. It was part of another workup. But just since it's a little tricky to read, I want to read it for you. These are scans of his left main proximal, right coronary, left anterior descending, and circumflex coronary arteries. And what it's showing is that there is no evidence of calcification or atherosclerotic buildup in these arteries from this test. And then he went on an Atkins diet for about two and a half years. Um, and most phases of the Atkins diet are ketogenic. And what happened to him was that he ended up having crushing chest pain, was diagnosed with a 99% blockage in one of his coronary arteries. Um, he had a you know, angioplasty, a stent placed immediately, and his doctors pulled him from the diet. He actually ended up suing the Atkins Corporation because this is not the kind of outcome you expect when you go on a weight loss diet. And here's another piece that I think we all know, but it's worth repeating, that the diet that we know works to actively reverse heart disease in many people is almost the exact opposite of a keto diet. It gets 10% of calories, not from carbs, but from fat. It's a very high, you know, it's a much higher carbohydrate diet. It focuses on, on nice whole foods, and it's vegetarian, vegan, or very heavily plant-based. This is the diet that we know works to actually reverse heart disease. So what about type 2 diabetes? Because I think this is another place where people think, well, all right, if you're going to decrease carbohydrate intake, it's going to drop your blood sugar. This could, be, this could be good, right, for diabetes. 
And we did see that. So this is a trial done in 2008, and what they found was that relative to a low glycemic index diet, a ketogenic diet did significantly drop A1C, whereas the change in the low GI diet was not significant. Fasting plasma glucose looked like it was about the same, but here's, this is big. So the folks on the keto diet, almost all of them were able to reduce or eliminate their glucose-lowering medications, and the low GI diet still had a pretty good showing here, might I add. But when you stop and think about it, like, okay, there's no carbs coming in, so it makes sense they'd have to go, but it almost maybe here looks like we have a cure for diabetes, right? I mean, patients are happy because their blood sugar's in a good place, their doctors are happy because they're reducing their glucose-lowering medications, so, I mean, we're done. We should just all go home. Problem solved. I think what we're looking at here, though, is a Band-Aid effect. We are getting at the symptom of diabetes, which is high blood sugar, type 2 diabetes, but we're not getting at the underlying cause. We're not getting at the pathophysiology. And it turns out that when you look at the pathophysiology, ketogenic diets can actually increase the insulin resistance that causes type 2 diabetes in the first place. So let's go into that a little bit. This should be fairly familiar to you all by now because we're going to be talking about how diabetes develops. So when you eat a meal that contains carbohydrate, you will have glucose levels build up in your cell. As a result, the pancreas will secrete insulin. Insulin acts like a key, opens the door in the cell. This is perhaps, say, a muscle cell. It opens the door that lets glucose come into the cell. There it goes. Great. <clears throat> now, if someone is overfeeding or eating a very high-fat diet in particular, you end up with buildup of fat in places where it should not be or ectopic fat deposits. This is known as lipotoxicity. In this case, they're little blobs. Those are the intramyocellular lipid, if we're looking at a muscle cell here. And this is really the core of, you know, one of the main reasons that people are developing diabetes in the first place. This is more of the pathophysiology as opposed to just the symptom of high blood sugar. So how does this work? We have obesity and high fat feeding, so the fat you eat or the fat that's on your body, and that results in an increase in plasma-free fatty acids. Those in particular can build up in muscle, liver, of course, in the fat cells themselves. There are a lot of different physiological pathways that the body proceeds through in these conditions, but they end up leading to insulin resistance, eventually over time type 2 diabetes, and all the sort of metabolic syndrome diseases that we would expect to see. So, Here's an interesting study. We can actually induce insulin resistance with a ketogenic diet in young, healthy individuals, and we can do it in just three days. It's like magic. So this study took nine healthy young men. They were, I believe they were in their 20s, or average age was in their 20s, and they put them on either a balanced diet or they put them on a ketogenic. Actually, it was a low-carbohydrate, high-fat diet. So it got about 20% of its calories from carbohydrates, so a little higher, but they were still in ketosis because they measured their ketone levels. And what they found was that in just three days, if they gave them an oral glucose tolerance test, so if they actually challenged their body's ability to process and utilize carbohydrates, they found that the normal diet here, ND, you know, the blood sugar rose and came back down the way you would expect it. In the ketogenic diet state, the low-carb, low high-fat diet state, there was a significantly higher glucose level initially and throughout. And this was as measured by area under the curve, statistically significant, and at certain points along the way. So why, why was that? Well, their first phase insulin secretion was lower than the folks who were eating a normal diet. You can see that's the, um, the solid, I'm sorry, the dashed line here. There we go. And so this was actually, it wasn't significant in terms of insulin secretion overall, but it was in that first phase. And they used something called the first phase insulin secretion index to measure this. And the interesting fact here is that a depression in first phase insulin secretion is also an early sign of type 2 diabetes. So we can actually start inducing the earliest signs of type 2 diabetes in men who were previously completely healthy and young just by putting them on a very high-fat, low-carb diet. So I'm going to tell you guys a story now. It's about Santa and diabetes and his toy-making machine to really sort of get a feel for how this all works. So this is Santa's toy-making machine. He has these lovely toy parts coming in. They go through the machine. They make these cute little robot toys on the other side. Everything is going great. This is akin to a normal body that's functioning in a healthy way with no, no type 2 diabetes. We have glucose coming in. The cells can use it as fuel. And then good health results because we're eating these, you know, whole grains and beans and fruits and vegetables, these really health-promoting, longevity-promoting sources of carbohydrate. Santa's happy. All right. 
So after decades of neglect, the machine gets all gunked up. The toy parts build up because the machine's working at just a fraction of its original speed. The, the workshop is completely cluttered. The elves can't move. No one's getting any work done. So Santa is not feeling too great about this. And this is somewhat akin to what we're seeing in type 2 diabetes. Glucose is building up in the blood. Why is that? Because we've got intracellular lipid interfering with insulin signaling so that the cells can't use the glucose appropriately, and long-term health is going to suffer as a result. So Santa Claus is not happy with this scenario, so he calls his go-to elf, and he says, elf, we got to fix this. This is not something that we can work with. Nobody can get their jobs done. It's not going to be a good Christmas this year. So the elf says, hmm, and we're going to call him the keto elf, because what he decides to do is say, you know what? I'm going to clean up this workshop, and I'm going to do it pretty fast. What I'm going to do is not order so many toy parts. So what happens is that the workshop looks clean. If you don't order many toy parts, the machine can eventually get through the backlog and crank out a sort of sad little, sad little toy. But, you know, the workshop looks good, and that's what matters. So the elf is really proud of himself. Good job, elf. All right, so again, we can see how this ties into a ketogenic diet. Hey, look, we just blood sugar levels look great. Place looks clean. This is good because we just don't really have much in the way of glucose coming in anymore. But long-term health is questionable <laughs> with this approach. So Santa's not happy. Why isn't Santa happy? Because Santa knows that when Christmas time rolls around, you're going to have to start increasing the orders of toy parts again because you're going to need to make enough toys for the girls and boys, but you can't do that if the machine is still all junked up. So same thing in terms of type 2 diabetes. Eventually, you would hope that you could start reintroducing these nice health-promoting carbohydrates, but if you haven't actually fixed the underlying problem, which you likely haven't on a keto diet unless enormous amounts of weight have been lost, you're in a, you're in a pickle. So Santa's not happy. He's like, all right, we got to actually get at this and fix the machine. So he tells his elf to go actually clean things up. We can also do something similar, data suggests, with a very low, very low fat, whole food plant-based diet. And what happens? The machine starts running the way it's supposed to. You can reintroduce toy parts, or in this case, carbohydrate-containing foods, and the body is tolerant of them because it's been restored to its, the way it's supposed to work. Long-term health results, Christmas is saved, Santa's happy, the elf is happy, and everybody wins. <laughs> Thanks, Santa. All right, so now that we've looked at lipotoxicity and how fat plays into this and how we, you know, we're just looking at what glucose does in terms of it being a symptom and not a cause, let's look again at how different approaches to type 2 diabetes look in this context. So this is actually going to be, a, we've looked at, these are two separate studies, but it's a 24-week ketogenic study. It's actually the one we already looked at versus a 22-week low-fat vegan study, so fairly comparable. Um, we had A1C drops in both, um, a little bit more in the ketogenic diet. In terms of decreasing medication, again, this is, we expect to see this. 95% of people off their meds, which again, wow, or not off their meds, reductions in meds. Um, so people think this is great. Low-fat vegan diet, wow, that, yeah, you know, maybe not even half of people. So still people are getting off or reducing their medications, but not as much. Although I should say in this study they were actively trying to not reduce people's medications to see the signal for A1C. And, of course, there's no change in the keto group, which we were kind of expecting, no significant change, and a, a significant decrease in bad cholesterol in the low-fat vegan group, which I think probably at this point none of you are surprised to see. And the question here is have they recovered their carbohydrate tolerance? Are they able to process carbohydrates the way the body is supposed to? Well, for, we know on the low-fat vegan diet that they can because they've accomplished this, they've achieved these reductions on a high-carbohydrate diet. So they've got lots of carbohydrates coming in and their body is recovering its ability to handle them. If we were to challenge the folks who'd been on a keto diet with carbohydrates, I don't know, they didn't do it, but I suspect that they would not have such wonderful numbers at the end. So again, the goal here is to get at the underlying cause, and keto diets do a great job of fixing the symptom. So I think we can all go with Salad Santa here in terms of looking at a long-term big picture versus a short-term symptomatic improvement. All right. What about Alzheimer's disease? Has anyone heard? Okay, show of hands. Who's heard of this keto diets being used for Alzheimer's? Yeah, it's a little more obscure, but why do they think this might work? 
So neurons in Alzheimer's disease actually display insulin resistance. Some researchers have gone as far as to call it type 3 diabetes. That might be a little far, but the cells don't take up glucose as well because they resist that insulin signal, and as a result, they don't function as well. So the thought is if we put people on a keto diet, the brain cells can use ketone bodies as an alternate fuel source. And so it turns out that people with Alzheimer's disease are not really into diet change. <laughs> so they actually used... They actually used medication to induce mild ketosis in Alzheimer's patients while they were still eating a typical diet. And what they found was there was a, some cognitive improvement, symptoms improvement, in a, small sub, in a subgroup of folks. So actually, it was the people without the, the risk allele. But they did find some improvement, but it was temporary. And again, we know it was only symptomatic. So the disease still progressed. They just got some temporary improvement. So, you know, potentially in a treatment of someone who's very far gone for a short period of time, this could be good. But for someone who's trying to prevent Alzheimer's disease, and this is where I see the confusion set in, this kind of diet is actually probably one of the worst things you could do. We know saturated fat intake is associated with a higher risk of getting Alzheimer's disease. So you put someone on a keto diet who's like, oh, well, my mom had Alzheimer's. I don't want it. I heard it can work for Alzheimer's. And the problem is they've actually increased their risk of getting it down the road. So this is, while there might be some symptomatic improvement short term for a subgroup of people, long term for most people, this is not a safe approach. There's also been some talk of ketogenic diets being used as a cancer treatment adjuvant because we know that cancer cells do like to use glucose, although they can still use other fuels. So hey, maybe if we put people on a ketogenic diet while they are in treatment, that will help. So far, there have only been case reports and the results have been mixed. So we're actually just in phase one trials on this right now, trying to even prove that they're safe. To this point, however, there it is not a recommended approach. This is actually from a 2014 integrative oncology working group out of Germany, and they said that these diets are not recommended at this time. Why did they say that? Because the side effects of a ketogenic diet very much mimic, in some cases, the side effects of chemotherapy, and people's best chance at a higher survival rate comes when they can get through their treatment, and if you put them on a diet that keeps them from getting through their treatment and compromises nutritional status, you're, in, you're not in a good place. So not recommended at this time. All right, so let's talk about benefits and risks. There are a couple benefits, so to speak. There is seizure reduction. Again, resistant, drug-resistant seizures, we know that you can get a reduction there. Decreased calorie intake, probably because people don't really feel that great while they're eating this way, and there's not a lot of variety, so it does decrease calorie intake. Uh, it does improve blood sugar control insofar as there's just not a lot of carbohydrate to control in the first place. And it can improve some cardiovascular disease risk factors, triglycerides and HDL. So what about the side effects and risks? Okay, get ready. This is going to be like that fast-talking guy at the end of a drug commercial. Do you know the guy I'm talking about? All right, so there are quite a few. First, nutrient deficiencies. All the diets that are used for seizure control, they use multi multivitamins, minerals, lots and lots of supplements. These are not, you know, nutritionally sound diets to be on long-term. I should also say that when used for seizure control, the goal is to get people off of keto diets as soon as possible. Uh, yeah, so if you take the fiber mostly out of someone's diet and you ramp up the animal products, that's a no-go situation. <laughs> so the next thing here is, again, like I just mentioned, that some of these side effects overlap a little bit with chemo. Nausea, fatigue, muscle aches, headaches, and this is known in the, blog of, in the blogosphere somewhat affectionately as the keto flu. I, so apparently this is what happens when you transition onto a keto diet for a week or 10 days. You just feel awful. So that could be a sign right there that maybe this is not optimal, but that's a side effect. And again, we know in the short term you can impair glucose tolerance in healthy people. Oh wait, there's more. All right, so we know that a single high-fat meal can actually impair arteries' ability to widen to deliver you know, oxygenated blood when that's needed. That's a problem if you want to you know, go up a flight of stairs and you maybe have some plaque in your arteries. We know that it increases bad cholesterol. We know that, in, actually, this is a study done this year where they actually, this is a better control, larger study. We found that if you put people on a ketogenic diet and ask them to do a sprint or an anaerobic activity, they perform worse on a keto diet than on a diet with, you know, modest amounts of carbohydrate. And, of course, you're going to, the way the body gets rid of acetone, in your breath. So you're going to smell like you're exhaling nail polish. Remember, that's not what most of us want to do. 
All right, but those are, those are just the short-term risks. Let's talk about the bigger picture here. And probably I should have mentioned this earlier, that low-carb diets, of which keto is the most extreme form, are linked to an increased risk of dying from all causes. So that's a pretty good reason right there to say, you know what, it doesn't matter if you lose a couple pounds and, and keel over doing it. Um, you're, as you can see, as these diets are practiced, they tend to increase things like processed meat and red meat. They decrease fiber, and that's a really good recipe for increasing the risk of colon cancer. It increases exposure to pollutants. So these persistent organic pollutants, things like dioxins and PCBs, they bioaccumulate in the fat of animals. And then if humans come in and eat that animal fat in quantity, they are getting an extraordinarily high exposure to these you know, endocrine disrupting chemicals that have also been linked to an increased risk of type 2 diabetes. And what, again, wait, there's more. Okay, this is actually very concerning. So women of reproductive age who go on these diets, there is a 30% increased risk in neural tube defects for women on low carb diets. These are things, the two that they looked at were spina bifida and anencephaly, which is not a survivable defect. And the problem here is that these defects occur typically, you know, in the first month or so of pregnancy, women don't know they're pregnant. So if they're on a low carb diet and they're of reproductive age, this is an extraordinarily risky situation. Uh, impaired artery function in the longer term, this was an analysis of six different studies showing that, you know, lower carbohydrate diets had a risk of increased artery damage, so that's not associated with good things. And then worsened heart disease, one trial looked at a very low fat, predominantly plant-based diet and compared that to an Atkins style diet. Perhaps unsurprisingly, blood flow to the heart improved on the low fat diet and got worse on the Atkins style diet. So that covers, I think, that's just actually a sampling. There's more, but we don't have time for that. So now we're gonna get some of these questions that you may have already gotten from patients. Are keto diets the same as a high-protein diet? I want a show of hands. Yes, they are. Anyone for yes, they are? Anyone for no, they're not? Okay, you're actually both right, and here's why. So technically, you're right. They are not the same thing as high-protein diets because, as we talked about, protein actually slows ketosis because it can be turned into glucose. So this is the gentleman who did the study on anaerobic athletic performance. And again, if you get too much protein in the diet, the body will use protein to make carbohydrates, which defeats the purpose if you're going for ketosis. But in the real world, are they high protein diets? Yeah, right, yeah, most of the time people are, again, we saw the pictures of what people are eating in the real world. These are high protein diets. Now, what about that rare person who says, oh, but I feel better on a keto diet. And there are some people who legitimately do, so let's figure out what's going on there. Did they lose weight? Some people lose weight, their self-esteem goes up, they just feel good because they've lost the weight and that colors everything else, so that's certainly a piece. They may have been drinking five sodas a day and eating donuts every morning, and now they're eating a lot of fat and animal products, but they've also introduced large amounts of non-starchy vegetables. That does happen and people can feel better if they're getting all kinds of nutrients that they didn't get before from that large intake of non-starchy vegetables. A lot of people are lactose intolerant, most of the planet actually. So when they go on a diet that eliminates sources of lactose or milk sugar, if they do have dairy products, they're usually eating ones that are low in lactose, they feel a lot better. Um, about one in 100 people have celiac disease, and a lot of them don't know it. So they too could have eliminated wheat and had celiac not known it, and they feel better. But it's not because they're on a keto diet, it's because they had some other underlying cause that was making them not feel well. So the goal here would be to reap the benefits on a safe eating plan. And then, oh, this I do want to show of hands. Who's heard of bulletproof coffee? Oh, I know, right? Okay, so bulletproof is one of the, you know, keto diets that's out there right now. This is, this is marketed as a brain-boosting trick. I don't know what you'd call it. So let's look at what this actually is. So this is bulletproof coffee. What are the ingredients? Cup of coffee. So far, so good. We could all use one of those, right? All right, one to two tablespoons of butter, preferably ghee, which is even more concentrated in fat than regular butter. And then one to two tablespoons of octane oil. What's that? All right, that's something that Bulletproof sells. It's pure medium chain triglycerides. But since it's 100% caprylic acid, this was their selling point on the website. I'm not kidding you. They said no disaster pants. Yeah. I don't even know, but I'm like, well, wow, what else would it, what could it have done? So the point is, I, you can look it up, Bulletproof Coffee, if you go to the Bulletproof site. Um, what you end up with is a 480 calorie cup of coffee with one quarter cup of pretty much pure fat, most of it saturated, the most dangerous kind for heart health. 
Yeah, so if you want to be bulletproof, just go ahead and run away from bulletproof coffee. <laughs> so in summary, we know that keto diets trigger that emergency backup system of ketosis. We know that they do help people who have drug-resistant epilepsy. The results are very much mixed and not too promising for other conditions at this point. There are a host of short-term side effects and long-term risks and eliminates the foods that are most associated with health and longevity. Conclusion, not a risk we're taking not a risk worth taking. We know, we have known for a long time that the optimal foods for health are, you know, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, a little bit of a few nuts and seeds. These are the foods that have always been and will continue to be optimal. Just a really quick plug, if you guys haven't visited already, nutritioncma.org, you can get more than 40 courses free online for doctors, nurses, and dietitians. Um, so you can go ahead and get your CME there. And now we have some time for questions. No, we don't. Do we?